Sure, Penn State has question marks going into this season, but so does West Virginia, more so than Penn State, and that's why I think the Nittany Lions still have the bigger advantage over the Mountaineers. You are Locked On Nittany Lions, your daily podcast on the Penn State Nittany Lions, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Two days away, just two days away from Penn State versus West Virginia, and that's why we are having a Locked On crossover episode. I'm Zach Seiko of Locked On Nittany Lions, and he's Mountaineer Paul but now Mountaineer Paul of Locked On West Virginia. So this is the first formal introduction of Mountaineer Paul, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Today's episode is brought to you by 5-Hour Energy. 5-Hour Energy fixes tired fast with zero sugar and a convenient portable size. It's the perfect pick-me-up for getting stuff done. Go to 5hourenergy.com. Use promo code LOCKEDONCFB to receive 20% off your order. This offer is only valid until September 30th on one order and cannot be used with other promotions. Go to 5hourenergy.com today. Well, we're going to get into all of it. The biggest storylines, keys to victory, and predictions in this episode as well. Paul, I'll, I'll start it off with this. Just kind of the one one of the things that's been going back and forth between not only West Virginia and Penn State, but just college football analysts in general, is that 53% completion percentage from your starting quarterback. West Virginia's starting quarterback, Garrett Green, completes 53% of his passes. That's not exactly ideal, but what's your take on it? Well, it's, it's not too far a cry from the 59% that Drew Aller completed as well. But I'll, I'll say that, you know, Garrett Green led the country in average yards per attempt at over 15. Part of the offense was to chuck it deep. It was run the ball, chuck it deep. That'd be and nice for Penn State to do. <laughs> right. Just by volume of measure, you're going to complete a little bit less. That's not to say he didn't have things he needed to clean up. He's a baseball kid. Man, he's a grown man. You know, but mm -hmm. uh, a lot of that footwork needed to be really, really worked and honed on over an off season. And this was really his first full go at that. And we've been told all camp long that it's 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 a lot better. They feel like he can climb probably seven, eight, maybe nine, ten completion percentage, um, which would be wild if he does that. It's it's hard to say what kind of year he could have because he, we already know what the legs bring. No, I completely understand that, and I addressed it myself in my individual preview uh, of both teams. West Virginia does have that. At least they swing for the fences anyway. I don't know if they hit a home run every single time. I mean, that's clear by almost completing less than 50% of your passes, but I thought this was the interesting part of it. So, yes, Garrett Green uh, only complete, completed 53% from a season ago, but part of that, if you look at Pro Football Focus's analytics, he had the second worst accuracy rate among quarterbacks as well. So it's a combination of, yeah, he's swinging for the fences, trying to hit home runs is that baseball reference that you mentioned since he played the sport, but uh, he's also, uh, he he's missing too many routine passes for a division one big 12 quarterback at that. Yeah. But he also led the country in big time throws and big time throw percentage. Okay. So the more difficult throws are the ones that he makes you know, and like you said, it's the routine ones that he struggles with. And he, he went into an address that he said it's basically mind slowing down and then realizing you don't have to put 100 percent of your effort into every single throw and layering that thing in there. That's just been a huge adjustment for him. Literally, it's been a four year process for him to do that. Mm -hmm. I, I believe he can do it. There are favorable things that he does on tape that says he can. It's just that he gets out of whack. He gets sped up and out of whack, you know, especially whenever he's rolling one way or the other. So I really do believe when it's another year in this offense, because they changed it a couple different times, bringing Graham Harrell in last year or the year before last wasn't a big – that was a big deal, you know, because they were preparing for a JT Daniels-led offense. And mm. so Garrett had to unlearn that, relearn – what they consider a Rust Belt type offense that Neil Brown runs, which is like an RPO type system as well. Mm -hmm. And so he hasn't really had the same system two years in a row. And this will be the first time and we all know quarterbacks make big jumps in year two. That also goes for Drew Aller as a starter as well. So it's a combination of stuff, but he throws it, he throws it deep the best of any quarterback in college football. He also led 
all of college football, according to PFS, under two minutes. He was the best two more minute quarterback in the country last year by the numbers. So I think there are favorable things for him in the game. There's no doubt about that he has to clean up some of the accuracy stuff intermediate wise. And I think he did that. Well, let's get Penn State side of it, right? You know, this is a crossover episode. Uh, West Virginia, I felt like, did that against favorable competition. Baylor's, UCF, those kind of teams where they really made, because they struggled against the likes of an Oklahoma Sooner Oklahoma Sooner team that, that wasn't that good, right? And I think of Penn State, who's coming into the season with early projections for another top 10 defense, Sure, they changed coordinators. Manny Diaz is gone. He's off to Duke. But now Tom Allen uh, is kind of a defensive mastermind himself, and it's loaded with talent. Abdul Carter, K.J. Winston are supposed to be first-round picks in next year's draft. And Deny Dennis Sutton is also in that conversation as well. So I know what West Virginia likes to do, but it's not like it's going to be easy. Not going to be easy, but I think it's doable most definitely. Especially okay, how do they at- do it? How do they do it in the, in the trenches? I think I think our offensive line can at least stalemate your defensive line. I believe against the number one rush defense from a season ago. I do. They did it last year. They they if if they had any passing attack, but wasn't game one. I believe they would have had much better shot in last year's game. Garrett Green's first game as a starter. Two of the three starting wide receivers weren't even on the team three weeks later, and they had to run the rest of the season with three freshmen in the starting lineup. So it was a huge adjustment for all of them as an offense. You guys call the earliest variation of this offense. I'm not saying we're the best offense in the country. I'm saying that there's been a huge world of improvement between then and the team you saw against North Carolina. And it's just a completely different offense. So there's going to be three phases needed to be accounted for. Even though in the press conference this week they said they're going to run it and try to go deep. I really do believe they've got some other plans, especially with a guy like Colt Taylor who just gets overlooked and all this talk, it seems like. He he and, and Warren had basically the same numbers. They both had mid mid forties catches. I think Warren had three more touchdowns. So but but he's a weapon in the middle of the field. He's six foot seven. And I think both of these guys are gonna have something to say about this game. But Garrett and he they're roommates, they've traveled all over the country working out this year. I really think they've learned to trust each other a little bit more as he came in from LSU last year. I think that's going to be a big jump for him as well. The other wide receivers in the room have made a ton of progress too. So I think, you know, just everybody's on a better path and page this year. And I think, you know, like we say all the time, big jump from year one to year two. Don't know how big of a jump it's going to be, but we're projecting it to be pretty big. So we're, we're banking on it. Let's say that. An immovable object versus an unstoppable force in in this case. Again, Penn State's run defense allowed 2.2 yards per carry, which was number one in the country a season ago, and they return all of the interior of that defensive line. They move Abdul Carter down to defensive end, deny Dennis Sutton is back with another year of experience under his belt. Tom DeLuca, Kobe King, right? So the, the core of what made that run defense really good a season ago is going up against a West Virginia team that has not one, not two, but three returning rushers, including Garrett Green, that had over 750 yards. So we'll talk about that more in the upcoming segment. Again, biggest storylines for Penn State versus West Virginia, and then later on our predictions, our score predictions, and how they will get to that final result, specifically coming up later on in the show. This is a Locked On crossover between Locked On Nittany Lions and Locked On West Virginia. Today's episode is brought to you by 5-Hour Energy. Are you tired after lunch? Well, you're not alone. In fact, research shows that 70% of us hit the wall after lunch. Let a 5-Hour Energy shot help you leap over that wall instead of crashing into it. With zero sugar and a convenient, portable size, it's the perfect pick-me-up for getting stuff done. The 5-Hour Energy website has flavors galore like watermelon, tropical burst, grape berry, and more. There is a flavor truly for everyone, and you can try them all. You go to the website, you even have an option to build your own 12 or 24 pack. You choose the flavors, and it's delivered right to your door conveniently. If you go to 5hourenergy.com, that is the number 5hourenergy.com, and get a 5-Hour Energy product today, you can use my promo code LOCKEDONCFB to receive 20% off your order. This offer is only valid until September 30th on one order and cannot be used with other promotions. 
promotions, and the code is not good on subscription orders either. Again, that is code Locked On CFB for 20% off your order. Go to 5hourenergy.com today. So, Paul, I'll throw it over to you to start for the second segment. What do you got for me? What does West Virginia see as the weaknesses of Penn State where they can where they can actually pull off the upset, where they feel really good about its matchup against the Nittany Lions? Well, you know, for me, what I've dug into is a couple different key areas I think Penn State has questions in. Obviously, the right tackle battle still rages on unless they've named something in the last 24 to 48 They'll hours. Start. They'll co-start. They'll co-start. And so that's that's not exactly something you're going to be 100% confident in coming into a brand new season, brand new game with a brand new offensive coordinator. You lose three offensive linemen to the NFL, which is kudos to Penn State. You had three guys go to the league. Wormley returns at center. Other than that, it's kind of a, a lot of guys with a lot of experience, but it's still being put together. I don't think that's going to be 100% to start this season. Maybe it eventually gets there. Uh, you know, obviously everybody knows about the backfield of Allen and Singleton. Curious how that's going to look. I think if West Virginia can hold them under 150 yards rushing like they did last year, and that's saying, the, you know, I really feel like that's pretty good. Drew Aller carried the team last year. West Virginia played decently as a run defense against you all last year. I was really happy about that. So, wide receivers, where's the skill talent? I said that in this my game the other day. Trey Wallace has been oft injured. Julian Fleming was supposed to be the savior, even though he's only got, what, 70, 80 catches over a four year career. That was supposed to be the number two guy for you guys. A, a kid that's basically a freshman, right? Amari Evans pushed him all camp long for one of those two or second or third spots. I think that's your biggest area of question. Most Penn State fans have also agreed with that. So if West Virginia is going to pull it off, it's going to be the experienced corners of West Virginia, although new to West Virginia. Very good singularly where they were at before combined with a very experienced back end with Aubrey Burks, who's somebody that most consider a top two or three safety in the Big 12, along with Anthony Wilson, who had almost 100 tackles last year. I think that combination back there is going to stabilize the back end of the defense. And if those corners can really do what they did at their previous spots, and we know Hollis and him running his mouth, we didn't like it, but he did. He's projected as a mid-round draft pick. So if he can live up to that, I think we've got a chance on the back end. And if the run into that defense can do what they did last year, like I said, what, I, what most consider to be a, a lesser offensive line for Penn State this year, at least without, I think so. I agree on Penn State's offensive line is unproven. The wide receivers, I don't need, I don't think they need to be this elite group of talent for Penn State's offense to move up and down the field because you have Drew Aller as a five-star quarterback, a former five-star. You have Nicholas Singleton, who was a former five-star. Katron Allen, who was a high-end four-star. So you have other ways to move the football. Tyler Warren, as you mentioned earlier in our show. So I, I see where West Virginia is like, hey, this is how we can attack Penn State or this is how we can, you know, create mismatches, if you will. But it's not like West Virginia's defense is elite or all world class in its own right. I get it. They got some reinforcements in the secondary because West Virginia had a, a lot of gaps in that defense that were easily exploited. And th those players... Hollis and another teammate came over from Northwestern. Penn State put up 40-plus points against Northwestern a season ago. So it's not like the, they, they came from a team that uh, gave Penn State a little bit of competition. But when I look at this front seven, okay, offensive line's an issue for Penn State. Wide receivers, uh, we held Singleton and Allen. Uh, West Virginia held Singleton and Allen a year ago in check. Okay, so, you sold, so West Virginia sold out for the run, right? Well, then that allowed Drew Aller to throw for 325 yards. Eight incompletions on 29 attempts, three touchdowns, no interceptions, and they got one sack against him. West Virginia's front seven is not good. The defensive line was one of the worst in terms of pass rush. They were bottom 20 a season ago per pro football focus, per PFF. And then when I look at guys like Lee Koba, who were absolutely phenomenal for that West Virginia defense a season ago, I think Koba is extremely underrated. I hope he makes it, you know, makes it in, in the NFL. I thought he was really good and had the best individual performance from, from West Virginia last season. He is not back. Beanie Bishop, same conversation. The two most elite defenders that carried West Virginia's defense and at least gave it a semblance of a defense a season ago are not back. You don't just casually replace that in week one. 
So, yes, Singleton and Allen were held in check a season ago, but now you don't have the guy that had the best performance to stop that ground game. And it's you real and, and again, Singleton and Allen are are better. They're back with more experience against a front seven that I'm just not convinced has it all together for West Virginia. And again, you lose your two star players that carried the defense a year ago. Yeah, I think that's a bit overblown. Uh, the front seven for West Virginia led to 20, 12 in the for, last for Beanie year. Bishop, who had four interceptions and 20 pass deflections. That's that's what he led the nation. Like that's, well, you that's were talking overblown. Front, you were talking front seven. I was just addressing. Okay, fair, that. fair. Okay. Um, but, um, you know, they led the Big 12 in sacks last year. I don't know what PFF number exactly you're referencing. I, I have no doubt in your what you researched or anything, but West Virginia led the Big 12 in sacks last year and tackles for loss. That didn't show against Penn State. You're correct. Uh, they had to figure a lot of things out going through the season. Tyron Bradley eventually stepped into a role at one of those bandit spots and became a real bright spot. And then we bring, you know, he's back. We're excited about him. Potomar Mulba is going to be really good in the middle of that defense as a run stopper. We feel former Penn about State that. guy. That's a former sure. Penn State guy. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And and obviously not the style of defensive tackle you guys have had there in the past, but he he's a he's more of your physical run stopper type guy. And then you know they they go three deep at every position on the defensive line. So um I don't know if their four star five star talents like Penn State has. They're more along the they're more along the lines of a developed three star player, uh somebody who spent four years getting their body ready to play power five football or power four football, whatever we call it these days. Mm-hmm. Sean Martin has been an all Big 12 talent in the past and he's back for his fifth year. And there's just a lot of old dudes there. As far as the linebacking room goes, it has the most talent that we've ever had in that room, and that's almost in West Virginia history. It's very unproven, very, very unproven. We talked about this before. Josiah Trotter, one of the most sought-after linebackers in in the state of Pennsylvania, obviously the the, the brother of the former Clemson linebacker, and his dad was Jeremiah Trotter, and he grew up eating, breathing, and sleeping linebacker. He was going to start as a true freshman last year. Unfortunately, that didn't work out, and he got injured, and he's starting this year. Trey Lathan really broke out last year uh, in the first four games, and, and some against Penn State had some flash plays. He got hurt. And then Reed Carrico comes over from Ohio State, and, and we really feel good about him in the middle of the defense or at one of the other linebacker spots. Either way it goes. But, but they have changed the defense as well. That's probably worth mentioning. They're going to a three-down front. They were more of a, a four-two-five. With It's kind of flipped in and out of a three-three-five and a four-two-five. So that's going to be interesting that they're just kind of going two, three downs. It's going to be fun. I think they're going to play a lot of press man coverage this year. as to where they were a zone team last year because that's what Beanie could do well. They really kind of build it around his talents as they figured out, oh, this guy's pretty good. And now they're going to be a little bit different. So I think that's going to be a big deal. I, I'll i go back to the, the point about, you know, the front seven. It, Lee, Lee Koba, linebacker, you, you can't – he almost had 100 tackles. So I, I mentioned Beanie Bishop, but I didn't mean to cut you off too. Lee Koba in that same thing, okay, in that front seven, he he led the team in tackles by a mile at ninety at ninety-seven. That's just not easy to replace. And then in that same breath, Beanie Bishop, who was able to at least he did everything for the secondary. Everything. Twenty pass deflections was number one in the nation. Kudos to him. Four interceptions was second in the nation. And that kind of star power, I don't see that. I, I I agree that everybody's going to naturally improve, but I don't see that star power with West Virginia's defense. Although I I do see star players on Penn State's offense that could you know get the better get the upper hand with that. Tyler Warren, Singleton, Allen, Singleton and Allen aren't just going to be you know okay we'll run them straight into the pile. It's a cloud of dust. They might get four or five yards. That's what West Virginia more or less likes to do with C.J. Donaldson. But these guys are going to be involved in the passing game as well. Singleton and Allen, even though Penn State's wide receivers have question marks, so what are they going to do to help with that? Get the running backs involved in the passing game too. Split them out at wide receiver because good luck as as a linebacker covering Nicholas Singleton in the open field. Yeah, I just don't see why that didn't work some more last year for him. You know, I think Coordinator, <laughs> Mike Yersich, that's why you fire Mike Yersich in uh, week nine, week ten. Yeah, that's a fair point. I, I think that is a fair point. And and just on the same token, I, you know, you have to consider that you guys have brand new coordinators at not two but three positions, correct? 
you also want special yeah. teams as well. Yes. So sweeping, sweeping across the board changes. The best time to get a team with sweeping across the board changes is in week one. That's to our favor. I do think that the West Virginia atmosphere will affect Drew Aller. It did in Illinois and other places on the road last year. He was definitely rattled at times. If the pass rush can get home in this game just a couple times, I think it could play huge, huge, huge dividends in this game. Obviously, that goes in every game. Uh, but, you know, I, it's going to be interesting. I, I really do think West Virginia has filled – actually, I think it's a better overall defense than it was last year because they, they were really not good. They were top 60 last year. It's like, you know, that's just – that probably falls along the lines of just below average, right? So, obviously, wasn't good enough. Had it been a top 30 defense, then that team's in the Big 12 championship game. No doubt about it. They were barely two losses away from 11 wins. You know, you lose the game in the fourth quarter against the Oklahoma State, and, and then you lose on a Hail Mary to Houston in what was the Dana Holgerson Bowl, basically, because there was a ton of emotion in that game, and it was similar to a rivalry game, actually, so they were in that. But Garrett Green and both of those games scored late touchdowns, unfortunately, to be undone. But, you know, I, we were almost an 11 win team last year. I know a day late, dollar short, but I think that 70% of that production is back, 84% of it on the offense. It's exciting, man. We have a reason to be excited in Morgantown. Even if we lose to Penn State, we're still excited about this season. We really are. And we feel like we have a real chance in this game. I really think it, last year I picked Penn State. You know, I knew going into that game, we weren't ready for that game. This year, I feel completely different. Well, we'll perfect setup for what's to come in the final segment. Predictions and also that atmosphere that you mentioned. The buildup for this game has been something different. And you have an excellent point about that, Paul. We'll discuss all of that next here in our Locked On crossover between the Nittany Lions and West Virginia coming up next. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. You've heard us talk a lot about FanDuel, America's number one sports book, but now we have something a little bit different for you. Now through September 22nd, all FanDuel customers can bet just $5. All it takes is $5 and you'll get a three week free trial of NFL Sunday ticket from YouTube and YouTube TV. Then with the YouTube TV base plan, you'll be able to watch every regular season, Sunday afternoon, out of market game. And all you need is a Google account, a current form of payment, and you can cancel it anytime. So there's no obligation. Just visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to download America's number one sports book. And if you look over at FanDuel right now, you can see the lines for Penn State versus West Virginia. There's been some line movement for the Mountaineers down to an eight and a half spread. Penn State's still the favorite, but it is an eight and a half spread. Penn State is minus 285 on the money line. West Virginia is plus 230, and the total is set at 51 and a half. If you like those lines, you can bet them right now over at FanDuel.com. Again, that's FanDuel, America's number one sports book. And today's episode is also brought to you by Factor Meals. Factor is great because it's no prep, no mess type of meals that allow you to meet your wellness goals thanks to the menu of chef crafted meals with options like Calorie Smart, Protein Plus, and Keto. You get fresh, never frozen meals that are dietitian approved and ready to eat in just two minutes. So no matter how busy you are, you'll always have time to enjoy nutritious, great tasting meals from Factor. And Factor has such a great variety, 35 different meals to choose from, 60 add-ons as well, so you always have new flavors to explore. Keep the kitchen time to a minimum. Factor meals are ready in just two minutes, so there's no shopping, prepping, cooking, or cleaning up. Head over to factormeals.com slash lockedoncollege50 and use code LOCKEDONCOLLEGE50 to get 50% off your first box plus 20% off your next month. That's code LOCKEDONCOLLEGE50 at factormeals.com slash LOCKEDONCOLLEGE50 to get 50% off your first box plus 20% off your next month with an active subscription. Let's wrap it up by beginning with our predictions, kind of going into our final main points of why we think Penn State or West Virginia can win this game. And Paul, I'll, I'll start it off here. I think Penn State wins. I do think West Virginia covers. Early on, that 10.5 points at home, I don't disagree that West Virginia is not an improved team. Return the core of the offense, but... Again, the defense isn't going to be fixed when you have to replace those cornerstones of the defense that, again, was really lackluster, but those two guys carried them forward, and they're not there anymore. 
Penn State, same thing, work in progress, but I feel like with the talent that you have returning, you can overcome some of that, at least in the beginning. So those two things meet, because I will give you that. I think there's going to absolutely be timing issues, communication issues with Kotal Nicky's offense and Allen's defense, but it's not going to lead to an upset in my mind. Long story short, I think Penn State wins 31-24. to I think this total goes over, and I do think West Virginia still covers the current spread uh, of 8.5. Interesting. Yeah, I, I do think that it's going to be a close game. It, it's, I mean, it was a close game even last year through three quarters. It was 14 7 game. It's 14 mm-hmm. 7 game in the third quarter. A lot of people look at the end score and think it was a blowout. I don't necessarily think blowout. Clearly, Penn State was better. Uh, I think that's, that can't be argued. Um, but, you know, it's going to go into the fourth quarter and then maybe somebody pulls away. I think that somebody's West Virginia in this game. I think I think Drew Aller's going to make an early game mistake in a new offense, which is probably a little bit of a hot take because he didn't do that much last year. He did but not. Whether that's whether that's strap, sack, strip, fumble, or an interception, or just some missed throws, I think that the, this 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 is going to get to him from an atmosphere standpoint. Even though you guys play in a much tougher atmosphere, it's different when you're at home, and. West Virginia is a top 15 environment. So I really feel like that's going to make a difference in this game. And I've got West Virginia winning 33 to 30 on a walk off. Well, it is going to take, it is going to take points. I just, I just can't see against a top 10 caliber defense. Once again, West Virginia, again, it's, when I look at last year's schedule, doing that against Cincinnati, UCF, West Virginia didn't exactly face this gauntlet of elite That's defenses. not what everybody said in the, in the beginning of the year. When looking at the schedule before the year started, much like this year, it was TCU who had played the national championship game. And, you know, there was a lot of stuff like you look at before the season. It's not the same after. And so I don't know that that plays as big of a part this year as last year. But we'll see. I mean, it's a great point about who we – beat and and how we did it but that's the part of growth you know i I really think this team has grown yep and the same argument can be made for for drew aller's a second year starter he's played those road games when he was a first year starter that's a little different you know lights being a little bit too too bright when you're out in the state of ohio where you're from against the ohio state buckeyes who drew aller probably when he was a kid probably dreamed of playing for that's a completely different conversation but my point being is that he's had that experience now so morgantown will be a rowdy environment but not something that drew aller has not seen to this point if this was if drew aller if this was a year ago and drew aller's first road game was west virginia absolutely view that as as a negative for penn state but he does have the he does have those road trips under his belt now. So you have uh, West Virginia thirty three to thirty. I have Penn State thirty one to twenty four. Again, I think there are points in this game just because of all the things that we rattled off. But Paul, let's finish up with that with that environment and yeah. this back and forth, this discourse that Penn State fans and West Virginia fans have had online. Yeah, I, I've been entertained by it. You know, I can only get involved so much because again, podcast hosts here, you know, not not just a not just a, a regular casual or a diehard fan in this case. And I think you've had the same respect for that as well, just to kind of observe all of it. But I think you make an excellent right. point is that, and you have a little bit of a hot take here that Penn state has offered more juice in this, you know, whatever, if you think it's a rivalry or not, this matchup specifically, there has been more juice. There's been more adrenaline in this game alone than West Virginia and Pitt have had for the past few years, decade plus. Absolutely. It, it's really – Pat McAfee has amped it up a lot. I feel like just the addition of him and their crew coming to town has amped it up. Herb Street was on that show yesterday. I don't know if you caught the comments. He was out loud saying, you know, West Virginia the Big 12 is just weird. You know, the way this game is being built up, it's obvious that regional rivalries matter to people on both sides. I think a lot of Penn State fans, where they want to admit it or not, because everybody wants to be the cool kid and not acknowledge the little brother. I get that. But it's just not true. Both fans of fan bases have been not just involved, but extremely involved in the buildup to this game. I've been involved in almost every second of it. You've got West Virginia players on both sides unhappy. You know, Eddie Bister in an press conference saying, we didn't like that they scored with six seconds to go. You've got Garnett Hollis saying, I really want to beat these guys. We're going to beat these guys. Like, there's bulletin board material for Penn State, which is probably an argument you could have had. But, um, for me, also, Coke is handing out rally towels. There's going to be a jet flyover. 
West Virginia installed brand new lights in the lighting system. This was before they realized it was going to be a noon game. <laughs> yeah. They were anticipating this to be like, you know how South Carolina or Oklahoma looks when they score, the, the lights go on and off. Like that's what they installed, you know? So they were really trying to do a big atmosphere for this. Uh, and, and I really, it's just been one heck of a build. Have, have you ever seen just for uh, an out of conference game for Penn state, have, have a build similar to this? It makes me want to include West Virginia in, in the scheduling a little more often, or just these kind these kinds of games, whether that's a Syracuse, whether that is a pit, but at the end of the day, when you have these expanded conferences, you can't just, you don't have to anymore. You're going to play nine right. or 10 games that now boost your resume and you have a 12 team playoff, which is probably going to expand even further to 16. Hey, division two, II, division three, FCS, I'll do 24. So what, what's the hold up? <laughs> I digress. I digress from that, but Penn State and West Virginia, it's going to be a while. These contract negotiations for these uh, these home-and-home home games are decided years in advance. Penn State's got Syracuse at some point, Temple up next, right? All those, they basically do a rotation. You can't just fit. But that's where college football has moved away from. It's gone from, the, it's gone from that regional, Penn State, West Virginia, Pitt, Syracuse, Maryland, right? All the, all the classics to, you know, now, hey, Penn State's going to play USC, Penn State's going to play UCLA, Washington, West Virginia is going to play, you You know, at some point, maybe they play Utah in the Big 12 uh, Conference Championship. But it's all these different teams that you never would have thought of happened. And that's the commercialization of of college athletics as it is. So some people, I, I think it offers more value here because Penn State was just looking forward to Michigan and Ohio State. That that was their season because the season, the results of the season were dictated by those two games. And that's what, so Hollis isn't wrong when he says something like that. Oh, Penn State only cares about two select opponents. Well, yeah, because Northwestern didn't decide the game. Penn State was better. They knew they were better and it didn't affect the outcome of the season. A win or a loss against Michigan or Ohio State dictated the outcome here. So that's just kind of where we are uh, in, in college football. One quick last point on that. So we've been playing in the Big 12 for 10 years now, and I really feel like we have a good feel for it hasn't been good for the flying WB brand. You look at where West Virginia was in 2010, coming off of three BCS bowl wins, the one game away from a national championship appearance. They were Clemson. They were in that driver's seat to be a Clemson. And then conference realignment happens. You remove all your regional rivalries, and now you're playing Texas Tech and Baylor. Nobody cared, you know, and and, and we can't travel that far to an to an away game. So wait, so the commercialization of this. Sure, it might bring a few extra dollars, but it sure as heck isn't good for the fan bases. I can speak for, for, from experience on that, man. I think those are all excellent points about where college football is trending to. And if you look at the individual brand, like a West Virginia or a Penn State, uh, it, it affects everybody differently. But it's only, it is, depending on how you look at it, it's only going to get worse before it gets better. It's just, right, it's going to continue to be nationalized and expanded. It's not going to stop here. So we will see some bigger changes come in the next five, potentially 10 years down the road as well. An interesting and intriguing locked on crossover that's now going to finally. All the anticipations leading up to Penn State versus West Virginia. The kickoff is at noon Eastern time from Morgantown. It'll be an exciting one. Can West Virginia, you know, get a head start on its season? Can Penn State kind of keep the pace with where they want to go with college football playoff aspirations? We're going to have all the reactions here on, on our respective channels. Paul, I want to thank you for the time for, for doing this crossover episode. And again, welcome you to the network. Welcome to the Locked On Podcast Network. It is great to have you as the host of Locked On West Virginia. Thanks, Zach. It's great to be here, man. And thank you for making Locked On Nittany Lions and Locked On West Virginia your first listen and watch every single day. For your second listen, you got to check out Locked On College Football, hosted by Spencer McLaughlin. Spencer talks about everything college football related. Now previewing games, recapping them, analyzing the news. No more off-season talk. College football is back. Talking about actual games and Spencer has it all covered for you over on the Locked On College Football Podcast, available on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day.